I do hope you brought your Bible with you this morning. We are at Genesis chapter 23. We read the text in just a moment. It may not be immediately clear to you, as many have pointed out. It may not be immediately clear to you the spiritual nature of this text. But in the words of the reformer, Calvin has reminded us that this text, and no text, but he specifically said it about this text, is not superfluous. It has been given to us by God. And so we want to read it and meditate on it this morning for our growth in grace. This is Genesis chapter 23, all 20 verses. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of Sarah's life. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land, and he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. That was the custom of the elders of the city would be to sit at the gate. So this conversation is actually taking place in an outdoor fashion, a gathering of the, of the leading men of this town. Verse 11, Ephron responds to Abraham. He says, no, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and I give you the cave that is in it, in the sight of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bury your dead. <clears throat> then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land And he said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron. And Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, and the field, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites, before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is, Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. The apostle reminds us that all scripture is breathed out by God, exhaled from his very mouth. And as scripture, it is profitable for teaching, for reproof and for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so we pray, O Lord, this morning that you would use your word, these early narratives of your people, to train us. Rebuke and correct us where need be. Be our teacher, O Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, let's get oriented to the text just a little bit here. Uh, if you're at home and you haven't already, the sermon notes are posted for you. If you are looking for them here in the sanctuary, they were stuffed in your worship guide. It is that extra sheet that's hanging around in there. You can follow along. This is a format that I learned many years ago, uh, modeled after the Puritans who would uh, do a, an exposition, they would call it, of the text, and they would give a doctrine, and then they would explain its use. I've tried to give you some updated terms, a scripture explanation for exposition, a teaching summary for the idea of doctrine, and life application for the word use. So I hope that's a little clearer to you, but that's the path we'll follow. And when we get to the scripture explanation, we're going to look at two points. And if you're at home, you probably already have these. If you're in the sanctuary, you'll need to write these down. The need, verses 1 through 9, and the negotiation, verses 10 through 15, uh, 16, 10 through 16, 17 to the end of the chapter is a summary of the event. So we're going to look at the need and the negotiation, and then we'll take some time to look at how to put this into practice. In sermons past, over two weeks ago, as um, Ryan had the privilege of being able to move along further in the book of Jonah, which he is hopeful, I think, to wrap up at the end of June. Uh, while the elders are away at um, General Assembly, that following week uh, he will be finishing up Jonah with you. So going back um, f- two Sunday, two weeks ago, uh, we looked at Genesis chapter 22. I think this is important to understand what we just read. In Genesis 22, Abraham was challenged at the point of God's promise regarding the descendants regarding the promise that he would be a great nation. They've been waiting for the son of promise to come, the son of laughter named Isaac. That's what his name means. He finally arrives, and they celebrate. He grows to be a young man, and Abraham is commanded to take him and to sacrifice him to God. And in a moment, testing Abraham is willing to trust God with such a challenge. And he gives his son over, and God, by his grace, halts Abraham's hand demonstrating that he does not require the sacrifice of the children of his people, but he himself will provide a sacrifice. But Abraham, for our, for our work this morning, Abraham is challenged at the point of the promise of God. The inviolable promise. Think about that. Inviolable promise from an invincible God. He has is, he is given his word. I think about some of the old timers that I grew up with, you know, my word is my bond. I mean, they'd, they'd die as to break a promise, many of these men. And yet no human being is a true promise keeper. Only God is a promise keeper. And to be challenged, like, so Genesis 12, 15, and 17, where the covenant is made, is ratified, and the promises are laid out uh, that he would give To Abraham, a great name, he would make him a great nation, and he would give him a land to dwell in. And so 22, which is needs to be read in conjunction with 23, challenges Abraham's faith in God at the very point of the promise regarding many descendants. That is why he said to those fellows, to, to those servants, to those fellow travelers to the place. Of sacrifice, you stay here. The boy and I are going to go over there and we are going to come back to you. Remember the apostle, the writer of Hebrews? He picks up on that and he says, he tells us in Hebrews 11 that Abraham believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead if need be. Indeed, he delivered him. Abraham trusted God with a very difficult moment in his life, a great challenge. Well, here is another challenge. Chapter 23, we have a challenge. Abraham experiences a challenge to the promise with respect to the land, of a place to dwell. He comes to a very difficult moment in his life. His wife, his treasured wife, his princess. For indeed, that's what Sarah means, and that's what Sarah was. His princess, a princess of God and a princess to Abraham. And he loved her with a deep affection as a godly man should love his wife. 
you guys are slow. Man. I mean, at least give me a holy grunt. Something, men. It's a softball, right? Godly men love their wives. Yes. Ladies, my sisters in Christ, be encouraged. Your men do love you. <clears throat> And she dies, 127 years, and she passes, and he mourns her death. Uh, there's something cryptic in the language in those opening verses about him having to go into her. Um, some think maybe Abraham was on a journey and he has returned. But he does go into the tent where she has passed, and he there grieves for her passing. And then he looks around, and he has no place to bury her. He has no, the land has not yet been given to him by God. He's not taken possession of it. And so here's a moment in his life ordained by God that challenges him, his faith in God, God's inviolable promises, because he has no place to bury her. So we're going to examine our hearts today. We're going we're to let this perspective on the text move us to examine our hearts today do we trust God? Do we trust the Lord Jesus Christ with the hardest moments of our lives? Are we prone to despair? You know, in past times when I've preached this kind of text, I think I have erred in pitting despair against confidence. As I look back over my life, I'm not sure that bears out in my experience. What I find in Scripture, in the life of Abraham, certainly in Genesis, Genesis 23, but also very poignantly in the life of David, is that indeed despair, discouragement, and doubt do come. Even our own Westminster Confession of Faith tells us at the point of the assurance of faith that sometimes our faith is weak and sometimes we do doubt, but in the end, in Christ, it gets the victory. And so the point is not, do we despair or not despair? The question is, when hard things come, in our despair, do we turn, do we turn to God? And so that's the question this morning that we want to look at. Let me unfold it a little bit first by taking just a quick look, um, touching on it, the need. Verses 1 through 9, Sarah's death and Abraham's mourning. You see, that's what these verses are about, 1 through 9. Uh, he does begin to enter into a bit of the negotiation. Um, he's commenting that he needs a place to bury Sarah. Um, you, you see that the morning, and Abraham went, this is verse 2, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Jesus himself tells us that blessed are those that mourn. When his own friend, John the Baptist, died, Jesus wept for him. And so even though we, we, we understand, right, that because of the resurrection and because of the promises of God that we hold fast to, there is hope, right? And we're not to grieve or mourn as men and women without hope. That's what the apostle tells us, right? Yet there's an appropriate place for Christ himself models it for us of mourning, of, we, of letting our humanity be put on display. We are sad at the passing of our loved ones. It is a great challenge. Death is a great thief. It is an enemy that through the resurrection of Christ has been turned into a mere portal through which we walk into the presence of God. Nevertheless, it is an enemy and it is to be mourned. It is, we, it is good and right to weep. And Abraham gives us that example just as Christ himself does. And so it is a challenge. This is the point of need. And then he begins to look for a, a place to bury her. And he, he owns no property. Though uh, God has bequeathed it to him, he, he does, he's not taken possession of it. And so he speaks to the Hittites who are living around him. And this is great because they have a very good um, opinion of Abraham. He has a great reputation among them. He asks um, and he, about having a place, and they say verse 6 there. My eyes aren't failing me here. I think it's verse 6. Hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choices of tombs. Now, this is when you begin to know that these guys, 
that they're not, that you cannot read this with 21st century American eyes. If you said, hey, I got a need, and somebody said, hey, well, I'll give you a place, you just said, hey, that's fantastic. Um, but they go through a little bit of a ritual here uh, that you need to pay attention to because we'll give you a place wasn't the final word. They were, um, by, by the rules of hospitality of their time, of their day, and of their place, they were required to do that. And Abraham, in like manner, is required to respond without taking advantage of them. If he had, and he, and he would have been in his rights, he could have said, hey, thank you very much. But then his name would not have been held in high esteem among the surrounding nations. They would have, uh, they'd, they'd have done what most Southerners do when if you really make a faux pas and they just say, you know, bless your little old heart. You know, that's, that's what, we, you'd, you'd have got your heart blessed. Abraham would have had a heart blessing if he had not followed the rules of hospitality. But they do have a high opinion of him. They did not have to say what they said. And he rises and he bows to them, um, an act of honor. This is not worship. Uh, this is just the custom of the time. I, I went to Nigeria on a mission trip many years ago, and um, I was very uncomfortable not, not, not having experience with it and not realizing that it was simply their custom. Uh, but like we shake hands, uh, the Nigerians would bow to one another, and I was very uncomfortable uh, with that. Uh, but it's, they weren't worshiping anybody. They were just showing respect, like saying, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. <laughs> and so here is the need, and then the negotiation. So verses 10, it begins. He, uh, he makes it known, um, 8 and 9, that he wants Ephron's field. And the cave that's in it. Oh, Ephron really liked that field. There's a couple of other places in the Bible. Um, I had the citations, I've forgotten them. It's, it's, um, I think it's in the Kings, um, maybe in the Chronicles, but where this kind of selling of property negotiation happens. And so that's why we know this is a negotiation, that Abraham's required to do this dance, because we have this in other places in the Bible. And a field of this size should have sold for a lot less. If you compare it with the other passage in the Old Testament, it's a much smaller sum of money later in the Old Testament. And it's not because of deflation. All right? Ephraim likes this field. He really doesn't want Abraham to have it. He charges him an arm and a leg for it. And Abraham, in an act of trusting God, pays the price of extortion. Verse 10, Ephron was sitting among the Hittites. Ephron, the Hittite, he answered Abraham, right? Now, my Lord, hear me. This is at verse 11. I give you the field. I give you the cave that is in it. And then my favorite part, though, is when Abraham bows and he says, hey, um, you listen to me, Ephron. Uh, I will give the price. Uh, all you have to do is just state, state your price. And Ephron, he does it in such a backhanded way. My Lord, listen to me. You know, they keep saying, hear me, listen to me, All right? Pleading with one another. Uh, four, 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? You can have the field, All right? This is like Ruth and Boaz. When Boaz came to, to settle with the, with the kinsman redeemer that was closer to Ruth than he was, and uh, he shows him the bottom of his shoe, and the guy knows to back off, right? Abraham pulls a Boaz kind of a move, and he doesn't flinch when he is asked for the exorbitant price for the property. Verse 16, Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. He paid the price, and I believe this is an act of faith because Abraham had already been promised by God that he would take possession of this land. He didn't need to buy it, but he had a need to bury his wife. And God met him in that moment and made provision for him. And so I would say to you, brothers and sisters, this morning, here's the truth that comes out of this brief scriptural survey, this observation, this explanation 
rooted in the inviolable promises of an invincible God. Abraham, by faith, takes confident action to buy a field in the land of Canaan, the land promised to him. And that promise is recorded in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. And if we can observe this together, we will see we have so much more in the light of the resurrection. We have so much more reason to trust God with our hardest moments. You know, we weren't promised many sons. We weren't promised a great land to dwell in. We have other promises in Christ that have superseded those promises. Those promises to Abraham, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. If you haven't gone and looked that up, I have mentioned it many times in the preaching of the book of Genesis. If you haven't gone and looked it up yet, write that citation down and spend your Lord's Day afternoon looking at Galatians 3, verse 8. These three promises of a name, a land, and a nation, they have grown up, they mature into the promises of the gospel. And the Apostle Paul calls them that. And so while we're not promised an Isaac, we're not promised a place to bury our dead, God gives us so much more. And in the weeks and months that we've been walking through the book of Genesis, as we've looked at the promises, I've offered four to you. I'm going to rehearse those very quickly, and then I'm going to add three more to it. And so if you've been taking notes and you want to go back later today and find those four and then add these three to it, I think this would make wonderful material for your mirror to look in, to look at every morning that you get up and remember the promises, the inviolable promises that the invincible God of the universe has made to you, and let your faith be assured and strengthened that you might, like Abraham, act in confidence in this world as you face tough things. And so here are the four promises that I've been rehearsing with you. First is the forgiveness of sin. That was from Ephesians 1, verse 7. We have that in Christ, forgiveness of sin. We have a promise that Jesus is going to build his church, uh, Matthew 16, 18. That was so important because as we look around the world, uh, I'm sorry, as we look around our, our nation, we sometimes wonder, are we going to suffer the same as the church in the United States of America? Are churches in this country going to suffer the same fate as, as Christians and churches in Western Europe? And are we going to be in an in unrecoverable decline? And if that's true, that it is an unrecoverable decline, and I don't think that it is, what does that say about the inviolable promise of Jesus in Matthew 16, 18, when he said, I will build my church? To get just a taste of it, we look around the world and we see that the, that the church is flourishing in so many other continents. Third, a providential protection. God promises in Romans 8, 28, for the purpose of sanctification. In Romans 8, 28, he promises for the purpose of our being set apart for God's use, for our sanctification to protect us, to work all things for our good. That is the good of the elect, the good of God's people, that we might give him praise. And then fourth, the second coming, the return of Jesus. Acts 1, 11, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. In Revelation 22, the last two verses where John prays, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. These are wonderful promises that God has given to us so that we, like Abraham, can set our feet firmly on the, on the unbreakable promise of God. Think about this. When you need an assurance of faith, when you need an assurance of your salvation, where do you look? Do you look inside your guts and in your heart for feeling? Like, I, wanna, I want my feelings to match this. And if I don't feel it, you know, then I just, I must not have it. Is that, is that what you look? That's an inversion, really. And that will mess you up every time because your feelings will deceive you. You know you've heard of waking up on the wrong side of the bed. It happens to the best of us. Your feelings are no true gauge of the work of God. But the inviolable, the unbreakable promises of God, now there's a sure foundation. When you want assurance of faith, 
When you want to know that you really belong to God, look to Christ and what he's done. It's a historical certainty. It's a biblical certainty. And out of the work of Christ, he has promised us forgiveness, expansion, providential care, and that he'll return for us and deliver us into his presence. Let's add three promises to that that we can set our feet on this morning. And let me couch it this way. These three promises... I hope that this totally radicalizes in a delightful way your coming to the table this morning. Because as you come to the table to eat bread and to drink wine, to, eat the, to, to partake in the body and the blood of Christ, it is a trusting Him for these promises, the four mentioned and the three I'm about to add to it. But as I give you these three, and as you begin to examine your heart and prepare for coming to the Lord's table as a child of God, you put that bread in your mouth and you drink that, that heavenly drink. What it symbolizes is who Christ is and joining together what he's done for you. Which can be articulated in all of his promises. The inviolable, unbreakable promises. And when we get them and our faith is strengthened in this manner... We then, like Abraham, we can go and buy a field with confidence. Whatever price somebody asks of it, whatever they ask of us. You know, this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, hey, if somebody asks you, you're on the road, guy comes along and he asks you for your, for your cloak, give him your shirt also. All right? Anybody, anybody asks you for a drink of water, give to them. We can act in faith, in confidence that God will care for his children. Here's the, here's the fifth promise, the first of these three. Promise of life amidst a reality of death. We all know we're going to die one day. And I, and I really, as I reflected on this, I drew it out of the death of Sarah. As I meditated on the fact that Abraham's dearest treasure on earth, his wife, had passed. She, she died. Many of you have experienced the death of a beloved relative or friend. And it stung, it stung like poison in an open wound. But you have a promise. I was meditating on this just a few days ago. Um, the, the, the death of Hope's father in 2018 when he passed. It was a great sting to our family. And I, I thought about the passing of my, my, my grandfather 2014. It was a great sting to me personally. But in both cases, there was hope because of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Eternal life. Death is not the end, but we have been given life. There's a promise of life. Life everlasting. This is, the, this is the hope that's in the Romans 3 and 6. You know, for, for the um, wages of sin is death, right? Uh, 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in 6, verse 23, and so the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is life. True life. Not just biological life, but spiritual life. What a profound promise. You come to eat today, you put the bread in your mouth, you drink from the cup, think about the promise that is won for you in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Life amidst the reality of death. And you spiritualize that. Think about all the challenges that you're facing, all the hardship, the difficult things that surround you in your marriage, with your children, with grandchildren, with parents, with grandparents, all oh, the challenges with those that you work with, the challenges in our community, the challenges in our nation. Think about them. Think about the, the opportunities that are before us as well in the midst of those challenges. And remember that God has promised to his people life in Christ. A promise of financial resource, a sustenance amidst need. Every day you get hungry. 
Every day you have need. This is a funny between uh, hope and me. Um, you can tell by my size. I get hungry a lot and I have to eat. Uh, my wife, you can tell by her size, uh, she doesn't have to eat quite as much. Um, and it, and she, it really cracks me up. I don't get it. I don't understand. She says to me, are you, are you eating again? I mean, it's dinner time. It's not like I'm eating a snack. She says, I just wish we just had, didn't have to eat so much. Like three times a day, Hope, that's it, right? And Jesus says to us in Matthew 6, that if you will seek first God's kingdom, God's righteousness, and in the context of Matthew 6, he's been talking about food, shelter, and clothing. That's the context. He says, if you will seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, all these things, the food, shelter, and clothing, they will be added to you. What a blessed promise. I, I, I came to that, not, not just because that is a promise in the New Testament to us as believers, but it seems that it's born out of the event with Sarah and Abraham. Here was Abraham with a profound need, a simple place to bury his dead, a, a life need, a plot of land. And God made provision for him, and he promises provision for you as well, especially for those whose hearts are bent to devotion in him. And finally, a promise of grace for your family. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. This does come out of the Abrahamic experience, maybe even the Abrahamic promise as it is filtered to us through the gospel. But in Acts 2, that great sermon from Peter on the day of Pentecost, he tells us that these promises, the promises of the gospel, they are to you and to your children. If you're not dead yet, and if your children are not past yet, it is not too late to heal the wounds of division. The gospel is to you and to your family. And I would ask you to begin by praying. If you have the peace of the gospel in your family, then I pray that you would give thanks to God and praise him for that blessing. But these are three promises in the life application of today's text that I would ask you to add to your list, to your growing list of promises. Plant your feet firmly on them, the inviolable, unbreakable promises of an invincible God. We saw it in Abraham when he was challenged in his soul at the very heart of the promises, first with Isaac and the promise of descendants, then at the moment of Sarah's death and the promise of a place to dwell. He was challenged again and he let Abraham was moved that his faith, his action, they would match. His actions would match his belief. So uh, brothers and sisters, as you get ready to come to the table, in response to the word of God today, examine your hearts. Do you trust Jesus Christ with the hardest moments of your life? I know that you're prone to be discouraged. You're prone to have despair. That is a common human experience. And if that's where you find yourself today, turn to Jesus and to the powerful promises he has made in the gospel. And if turning to him means getting up from your seat and coming to the table, then you're invited to do that as his children. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, this coming to the table is an act of communion with him where those promises are made real. We're actually going to sing before we, we fence the table, read the institution. We're going to respond to this word in song and then in eating and drinking this meal of communion. Let this song be a prayer that consecrates the message today. If you'll go ahead and find it in your worship guide as the singers and musicians continue to come, would you stand to your feet? And as you stand, I will pray. Lord, apply the word of God to us now. By your Holy Spirit, come and meet your people. Build their faith. Make your promises real as we sing and as we feast. In Jesus' name, amen.